Hey guys and welcome back to another video on the channel. In today's video we're going to be taking a look at the Gaussian integral. So the way we'll be solving this is using polar coordinates and Jacobi, uh, the Jacobian pretty much. Okay. Now what is the Gaussian integral? Now it's a special type of integral that appears up all the time in probability and stats. Um, it appears in the normal distribution and other functions. So this is the integral. So the integral from pretty much negative infinity to infinity of e to the negative x squared dx. Okay. Now, originally it looks pretty harmless, but this is a really hard integral to solve. You can't use any single variable techniques like integration by parts, u substitution. You have to pretty much use, well, you can use polar coordinates like we're going to do today, or I have seen complex analysis done on this, and there's probably other ways to take a look at it. Okay? So the way we're going to start this is basically we're going to define it as just some integral. Let's just say, um, let's just say i, because that's like a standard thing for defining integral the saying i okay and what we're going to do is basically we're going to square it so the reason we're going to square this is because we're going to basically turn this into a multi-variable calc question okay so if we square this so we go i squared that's the same as having this integral twice okay so if you square something so if you say you had let's say a squared that's equivalent to a times a and there's two a's so likewise if there was a cubed that'd be a times a times a three times okay but I think if you're watching this video, you understand your index source pretty well because you are watching a video on Gaussian stuff. So well, this is what we're going to do. So this is equivalent to e to the negative x squared dx multiplied by uh, negative infinity to infinity of e to the negative x squared dx. Okay. Now, we can kind of treat this x as a dummy variable because it's going to be pretty much independent regardless of what variable you put there. So what we're going to do is replace the x's here with just y. So we're going to say all right, i squared is therefore equal to the integral from negative infinity to infinity of e to the negative x squared dx. And then we we'll replace all the x's with y because it doesn't really matter what variable we put there as long as we're like... Well, because it's going to be independent, whatever this evaluates to will be independent of the variable that you put there. So this is going to be the same as multiplying by the integral from negative infinity to infinity of e to negative y squared dy. Okay. Now the reason we've done this is because this turns this into a double integral. So in other words, we have i squared is equal to the integral. So uh, out of bounds, so negative infinity to infinity, negative infinity to infinity. Then we have e to negative x squared multiplied by e to the negative y squared um, d uh, it doesn't really matter which ones you put on the inside or the outside so I'm just going to put dx dy and I could see here if I'm multiplying these two things together because they have the same base we can add the indices so I can rewrite this as all right, i squared is equal to the integral from negative infinity to infinity and then this again so negative infinity to infinity e to the power of negative x squared plus y squared dx dy okay now we're going to change this into pretty much polar coordinates now if you were to graph just the normal function um just like the normal function like this it would look something like this it'd be like a distribution okay now imagine this we put this into a 3d space so this is a 2d scenario if we put this in 3d it would look something like this around like a z axis and this is like your x and y and it looks something like this now if you're standing here no matter where you look it's going to appear circular and of course whether you, your height is your circle is going to be bigger or smaller so we can pretty much replace the x and y's with their corresponding polar coordinates so we know from the unit circle the x is equal to the radius cos of the angle and we also know that y is equal to the radius sine of the angle okay now, what we have to do here is we have to be pretty careful because we have to account for, because we're changing variables, we have to account for any, um, pretty much the Jacobian. So a Jacobian basically states, like, if you're changing from one system of coordinates to another, you've got to account for any, like, stretches pretty much in, like, space and stuff because they're not exactly equivalent, if that makes sense. There's a better explanation on that, but that's basically what the Jacobian accounts for, um, any, like, stretches in space, okay? So this is how we're going to do it. So we we can substitute these into here. That's going to be all fine at the start. Well, let's just take a look at what we have to do straight up. So we know that x is going to be r cos theta, and we know that y is going to be r sine theta. 
we need to somehow replace this dx dy because we know that because of a circle we know that x squared plus y squared is going to be r squared so we know how to replace that but when we replace the dx dy we have to be very careful so our dx dy is basically going to be pretty much the Jacobian. So the way we calculate Jacobian will be the partial derivative of x and y over the partial derivative of r theta. So these are the two um, different variables we're changing to because we're using r here and theta here. So these are the two um, different variables we're going to change to. The absolute value of that, dr d theta. Okay. Now you're probably thinking, what does this all mean? Now, this is just um, pretty much notation for the Jacobian. So what this actually means, so this top bit here and this bottom bit here, basically equivalents to pretty much the determinant of a specific matrix. So this is equivalent to the determinant of the matrix where you have the partial derivative of x with respect to r, so the first one, that with that, and then the partial derivative of x with respect to the second variable, so theta, okay? So those are the two inputs of our matrix. Now this is a two by two, so the bottom bit will be, you guessed it, the partial derivative of y with the partial derivative um, with respect to r, and then the partial derivative of y with respect to theta, okay? And now this is a determinant. Now you're probably thinking, all right, how are we gonna find these? All right, well, that's why we've got this and this, okay? So. Let's find the part, let's find, let's differentiate this with respect to R only. So partial derivative of X with respect to R, you treat cos theta as a constant. So if you differentiate R, it's just going to be one. So our answer here is cos theta. Okay. So that's found. All right. Now we're going to differentiate this thing with respect to theta. So the partial derivative of X with respect to theta. Now you treat R as a constant. So if you differentiate cos, it's going to give you negative sign. So what we have here is negative R. Um, sine theta. Okay. Alrighty. And now we go find. So we found that. Now we go find. All right. The partial derivative of y with respect to r. So we differentiate this with respect to r. So sine theta is treated as a constant here. So partial derivative of y with respect to r. Differentiating r is just going to be sine theta. And then we differentiate with respect to theta. So differential of y with respect to theta. Treat r as a constant. If you differentiate, sine is going to give you cos. So what we're left with is r cos theta. Okay. Right. So now let's put this stuff into our matrix here. So this here is going to correspond with this bit here. Um, this bit. Let's just use a bunch of colors. So this makes it easier to see. That goes there. What else? Let's use let's use orange. And that can go here. And let's use yellow for the last one. Now, we can find the determinant of this by multiplying pretty much uh, these two bits here together, subtracting these two bits here together, okay? So in other words, the determinant of this is going to be delta, uh, well, the derivative of x with respect to r multiplied by the derivative of y with respect to theta minus the derivative of x with respect to theta multiplied by the derivative of y with respect to r, okay? Now we know what all those bits are, so let's substitute into here. So this is going to be all right, cos theta multiplied by r cos theta minus, and this minus applies to this entire bit here, so minus all right, delta x delta theta, so negative r sine theta multiplied by sine theta. Now you can already see what's going to happen here. So if we distribute this negative, what we're left with is r, well if we multiply here, r cos squared theta plus r sine squared theta. Now you take our factor r, cos squared theta plus sine squared theta. And we know this is one of our trig identities and we know this is actually equivalent to one. So our Jacobian is just r, okay? So when we're changing from dx dy, we're gonna replace this whole bit with just r. So dx dy is equivalent to, so dx dy is equivalent to r d, what was it? dr d theta. Right. -o. So now we can com fully convert over. So we have this integral up here and let's just take a look. Let's think about the bounds for a sec. So this is our integral we have at the moment. So negative infinity to infinity and then negative infinity to infinity of e to the negative x squared plus y squared 
um, d, did I say dx? Uh, dx, dy, okay? Now we're changing this into our new coordinates, okay? So, um, we can change this bit to r, r squared, because we know that x squared plus y squared is going to be r squared, and we can say that because no matter where you are on this thing, no matter the z position, it will always be some circle r, so, and we know that's the equation of a circle, so that's our right for substitution. Now, let's take a look at the bounds here. So, let's just leave these integrals and leave these bounds for a sec. So, this is going to be e to the negative r squared. Then, we replace this bit with our r d r d, r d theta. Sorry. So, d r d theta. All right. So, these bounds here, so this integral is going to correspond to the bounds of r. Now, what is our r bounded to? Let's take a look visually of this function here. So r can be pretty much zero to pretty much as big as it wants because no matter how far you go down, this r can extend pretty much. So r basically goes from pretty much zero to infinity. Okay. Now what about theta? Theta is the angle, so that's pretty much just going to be zero degrees, one revolution, two pi degree, uh, two pi radians. Okay. So zero to two pi. Okay. Now this is our new integral. Okay. Righto. So let's evaluate this. So the way we do this double integral is pretty much we evaluate the inside integral first and whatever is left over, we put that in our integral here. So let's take a look at this integral here. So 0 to infinity of e to the negative r squared r dr. Okay. So this is quite easy to do. This is actually just the u substitutions because if we let u equal, well, we don't even have to do a u substitution. If we differentiate r squared, that's going to give us 2r. And if we divide it by that, that basically implies, all right, this, when you integrate this, actually, I'll just do u substitution much easier to explain. We can do a u substitution here by letting, all right, let r squared equal u. So r squared is, oops, r squared is u. So therefore, du, d, uh, whoops, dr du is going to be, um, what was I going to say, 2r, so when we replace the r here, that's equivalent, so dr is equivalent to 2r, no, I did that wrong, sorry, whoopsie, that's the other way around, nearly made a mistake there, I was correct, so d theta, r du, dr, is going to be 2r, so therefore du is going to be 2r is equal to dr. So when we put this into here, what we get is this new integral. So the integral, and if we put um, 0 into here, these bounds will still be the same. Because if you put 0 into here, it's u still going to be 0. If you put infinity in here, it's just going to be infinity squared, so we can still say that's infinity. So that's going to be u, uh, e to the negative u. Um, leave the r, and then we put this dr in, so we get du over 2 up. Uh, 2r and the r's cancel so what we're left with is pretty much a half the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the negative u du okay now if you integrate this it's just itself um, with the negative sign so e to the negative u from 0 to infinity and leave the half out the front now if you put infinity into the first term you get e to the negative infinity and as that goes to infinity, this term goes to zero. And if you put a zero up here, you're going to get, well, minus minus e to the zero, which is just one. So therefore, this entire integral here just evaluates to a half. Okay. So we can replace this inside integral with just a half. So we have the integral from zero to two pi of a half d theta. Okay. If you integrate that, that's just going to give you theta over two with our bounds here, two pi. Substitute zero, uh, substitute two pi in here. We can get two pi over two minus a uh, zero over two, which that goes to zero. So what we're left with is pi. Now we said this here was e so this is what our integral is equal to. So this is equal to pi, but we said this integral here is equal to i squared. Okay. So therefore, i squared is equal to pi. Therefore i is equal to the square root of pi. Hence, our original integral up here, our Gaussian integral, is equal to the square root of pi. Boom. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you found it informative, um, give it a like and subscribe.